kind of an engine service powwow did you have in mind, Mac? Troubleshooting tips, Tech, to improve performance or correct unusual conditions. Now, here's an example. On some 1960 and early 1961 cars, owners have asked for correction of an accelerator linkage rattle. Now, usually, this was traced to end play at the bell crank bracket that let the bell crank shaft shake sideways. To correct a condition like this, bend the outer shaft support tab on the dash-mounted bracket to reduce the amount of end play. Don't bend it too much or you'll put a bind in the linkage. A slight amount of end play should remain. That's a good point, Tech. Now, on cars with a spring-type rear engine mount, a harsh squawking sound is another possible condition. You can test for that by putting the car on a hoist and moving the propeller shaft up and down. Usually, the squawk is caused by misalignment of the engine mounts that lets the rear mount stud rub on the rubber stop. On a case like this, loosen the front engine mounts, shift the rear of the engine to center the stud in the rubber stop, tighten the front mounts to specifications, then recheck for elimination of the squawk. Very clear, Mac. I'll have no trouble fixing that. Good, Kurt. That spring-type rear engine mount permits controlled engine movement. Now, uh, this does a good job of minimizing the transmission of engine and driveline vibrations. Under certain driving conditions, however, engine movement may cause accelerator pedal bounce. If this accelerator pedal movement is objectionable after the engine has been properly tuned, the amount of rebound at the rear engine mount can be reduced. How do you do that, Mac? Well, you carefully measure the space between the lower stud washer and the rubber stop. That's how much the engine can move upward on rebound. It's usually about a quarter inch. Now, this measured distance can be eliminated. On 1960 cars, the cross member must be removed. But most 61 models have the stud nut welded in place. So remove the stud and turn it on a lathe to reduce shoulder height an amount equal to the space between the washer and the stop. Yeah, and don't ever replace the stud with a plain bolt. That can compress the spring fully and cause misalignment between the engine and drive line. Now, an alternate fix is to add just enough shims between the stud washer and the rubber stop to fill in the rebound gap. But use just enough shims to fill the space or you'll change drive line angle. Okay, Mac, I get the picture. Fine. Well, now, let's leave the rear mount and talk about questionable performance on a six-cylinder engine, one where detonation might be a factor. Detonation? Yeah, Kurt, and detonation is usually caused by low-octane fuel or incorrect ignition timing. Proper timing is two and one-half degrees before top center on all 170 and on the 225 cubic inch engines with manual transmissions. It's five degrees on the 225 cubic inch engine with torque flight transmission. If ignition timing is adjusted on the road to eliminate ping, be sure the timing is never retarded more than five degrees from the specified setting. If ignition timing is road tuned to get better performance with higher octane fuels, see that it is never advanced more than five degrees from the specified setting. Too much advance can cause pre-ignition, burned pistons, and other serious damage. And always remember to disconnect and plug the vacuum advance line whenever you're setting ignition timing, Kurt. All right, Tech, I'll watch that. And another thing, Kurt. Be sure to set engine idle at 550 RPM with the transmission in neutral. On engines equipped with an alternator, the bright light should be turned on. 550? You sure about that, Mac? That's right, Kurt. We're recommending a 550 curb idle on all 1960 and 1961 six-cylinder engines. This setting helps provide better engine idle operation. All right, I see what you're after. I'll set ignition timing and engine idle to specifications. That's the ticket. Now, I think Mac has another engine tip regarding fast idle. Oh, yeah. Adjusting fast idle and curb idle on early 1960 models six-cylinder engines is sometimes a problem. That's because the carburetor has only one screw for setting both fast and curb idle. As a result, fast idle may be too fast when curb idle is okay. And when fast idle is okay, curb idle may be too slow, 
causing rough idle or stalling. What kind of correction will that take, Mac? Well, you can install this curb idle adjusting screw and spring in the tapped hole that's provided. Then you'll be able to set curb idle separately and get a more accurate fast idle setting. It also ensures better choke and warm-up performance. Good deal, Mac, and easier than I thought. What's next? There's an occasional report of poor cold starting. It's caused by improper choke valve action due to gum deposits, which cause the choke vacuum piston to stick. Diagnosis can be made only when the engine is cold. When the engine is at normal operating temperature, the deposits become soft, freeing the choke piston temporarily. Certain fuels and fuel additives can contribute to gum formation. Also, low speed, stop and go driving in cold weather aggravates the condition. As good preventive maintenance when the car is in for service, squirt a few drops of carburetor cleaner into the vacuum piston chamber with the engine idling. Do this each time you service the air cleaner. Work the choke valve back and forth to help the cleaner remove the deposits from the piston and bore. On every major carburetor job, remove the piston so that you can clean it and the bore thoroughly. Okay, Mac, and I'll also clean out the vacuum passage. Now you're talking, Kurt. And uh, while we're on the carburetor, Mac has some good service ideas on engines equipped with the closed crankcase ventilation system. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me, Tech. Here's what I want to point out. If an engine has a rough idle, the flow valve in the closed crankcase ventilation system might be stuck in its open position. This would let excess air bleed in at idle and lean out the fuel mixture. The result? Rough idle and frequent stalling. Now to test for this, remove the flexible connecting tube and hold your thumb over the end. If the engine idle smooths out, see if the flow valve is dirty and needs cleaning. The chances are it does. That flow valve should be serviced regularly, especially when an owner operates his car under short trip driving conditions in cold weather. I'll keep it in mind, Tech. Any other tips? Yep. If the flow valve happens to be clean, test for more common causes of rough idle and stalling, such as vacuum line leaks, loose intake manifold, or valve lash too tight. Another important thing to check on all 1961 model six-cylinder engines is proper gasket installation between the carburetor and the manifold. It must be installed so the vacuum hole in the gasket indexes with the hole provided in the manifold for the crankcase ventilation system. If it is incorrectly installed, it may block the choke piston and the step-up piston vacuum ports. And if the vacuum hole is not positioned at the hole in the manifold, you'll have a rough engine idle. That vacuum hole has to line up with a hole provided in the manifold, or it'll cause an air leak. Right. Now, here's something different. On six-cylinder engines, there have been some complaints of a hydraulic-type knock at or near idle speed. It sounds similar to a bearing knock. Now, usually the cause is an improperly drilled camshaft rear bearing journal. If the camshaft oil passage that feeds oil to the rocker arm shaft is misdrilled, it'll break into one of the machine drive holes or the oil relief passage. Oil pressure will build up between the end of the shaft and core plug, causing a knock. Now, in addition, if the camshaft oil relief passage isn't drilled completely through, oil will be trapped behind the camshaft, force it forward, and cause a knock. This can also cause leakage at the core plug. You don't have to use an x-ray to track down this condition. So if uh, somebody will please turn the record over, we'll tell you how to test for the hydraulic type knock. Like Tech said, to test for the hydraulic knock, first attach an oil pressure gauge. Run the engine to bring in the knock, then reduce oil pressure a noticeable amount by backing off on the oil pump relief valve nut. Now, if that affects the knock, pull the camshaft for inspection. Suppose reducing oil pressure doesn't affect the noise. Well, in that case, the noise would not be a hydraulic knock. Instead, it would be a mechanical sound, which you'd have to track down. But let's talk about another engine noise that can be puzzling. Some six-cylinder engines may have a noticeable bearing rumble when cold. The noise goes away as soon as oil pressure builds up. 
It's caused by oil draining from the filter through the bearings. Now, in a case like this, make an oil filter extension pipe out of one quarter inch pipe. Install it to provide an oil reservoir for an added oil supply during initial starting. Details on making this extension are in the reference book. Good news, Mac. I'll give it a careful once over. You do that, Kurt. Now, here's a tip on new oil filters. Insert a blunt tool into the holes in the base of the filter and push against the rubber flapper valve to make sure it's free. Always do that on a filter before you install it. If the rubber anti-drain back valve is stuck, it'll prevent oil flow to the engine bearings. The warning light would go on or the oil pressure gauge would register no pressure. I get the idea, Mac. What else have you got? Well, here's another noise condition that can turn up on some 1959 and 1960 cars with 361, 383, and 413 cubic inch engines. It's a growling, grinding, or buzzing sound that you can hear most clearly at the oil pan. You can eliminate that noise by installing this new type oil pump relief valve spring damper. I see. Just squeeze that damper enough to slide it inside the spring. I get it. Now, let's take up some oil leak reports on six-cylinder engines. I honestly feel many oil leaks are not diagnosed correctly, and we should clear up the confusion. As an example, you must follow service manual procedure when removing and installing the oil pan, especially proper jacking up and blocking of the engine. Now, if you don't do that, you won't have the working room you need, and you're apt to bend the oil pan corners. Bent corners on the pan can't seal properly and will cause an oil leak. Another thing, the oil pan rear gasket on the six-cylinder engine has been changed. There are now five prongs for better gasket positioning. Oil pans, since this change, have five holes. Don't snip off any of those prongs. They help position the gasket properly so it won't leak. That's good advice, Tech. And earlier type oil pans can be easily adapted to the new gasket. You just drill three new holes in the oil pan flange. There's a template and instruction sheet with each new gasket package. Inspect the other holes to be sure they haven't been upset at the edges from over-tightening the pan cap screws. Flatten the holes if they have been upset. Good point, Tech. When you install the oil pan, Kurt, make sure the oil pump inlet screen is pressed firmly against the bottom of the pan. This prevents rattles at that point and ensures the proper pickup of oil. Now, besides that, remember to tighten oil pan retaining cap screws to 17 foot-pounds and tighten them in the proper sequence. You'll find a chart on tightening sequence in the reference book. That's good advice, Kurt. The wrong sequence or over-tightening can compress the gasket too much or upset transmission to crankshaft center line alignment. Okay, I'll keep it in mind. Atta boy. Now, suppose you run across a case where there's an oil leak at the rear crankshaft seal. Now, here's one way that that can happen. The number one and number four upper main bearing inserts might have been interchanged. They'll go in that way, of course. But the number one upper main bearing insert has a greater chamfer on the inside edge at the locating tab end to provide lubrication to the timing chain and sprockets. Putting this chamfered insert in the number four position will direct more oil against the rear main seal than it can handle. Uh, speaking of oil leaks, how about occasional leaks at the oil pump? Oh yeah, Tech. The pump to block cap screws might be too long and bottom in the holes. Install flat washers under each screw or cut one or two threads off each screw in order to compress the gasket enough to correct a leak. Now here's something else. It's a mighty good idea to install a new pump to block gasket. The old one may take a set or have an established leak path. Now, after installing a new gasket, Tighten the pump to block cap screws evenly to 15 foot-pounds torque and tighten the cover cap screws to 10 foot-pounds torque. And remember, tighten the screws only when cold. That's because the aluminum and steel expand and contract at different rates. Will do, Mac. Anything further on oil leaks? Yep. 
Oil leakage from the distributor housing vent holes may be caused by the gear retaining pinhole having been drilled through the spiral groove on the distributor shaft. The pin in the groove prevents reverse wiping of the oil. Now, in a case like this, position the gear on the shaft with the pin inserted just far enough to hold the original location. Drill a new hole 90 degrees from that location and install the pin in the new hole. Now, here's a tip on correcting a possible oil leak between the distributor and block. If the distributor has a cork gasket, replace it with this large O-ring. If the distributor already has a large O-ring and is leaking, remove and discard the ring. Slide this smaller O-ring into the small undercut under the retainer plate. Then, install a new large size O-ring. Very clear, Mac. Any other possible leak conditions? Well, Kurt, carelessness in positioning the six-cylinder head can damage the gasket at the right side of the engine and cause oil to leak from the valve pushrod chamber. The best thing to do is follow service manual procedure in removing and installing the cylinder head. Yeah, fella. Don't ever drop the head carelessly on the gasket and then slide it into place. That can damage the gasket and set up a bad leak before you know it. Don't worry, Tech. I'll set it down gently like a carton of eggs. <laughs> you do that, my boy. Now, here's another noise we haven't talked about. It can sound like a bad water pump or alternator bearing, but it's actually caused by a slightly loose belt. So check the belt for proper tension first. In some cases, a belt that runs loose and slips might develop a glazed area and continue to slip. So, install a new belt, properly torqued, before you blame the water pump or alternator. That makes sense. Got another noise example? Yep. On the six-cylinder, there's a sound that can be confused with a main bearing knock. You may hear it when the car is accelerated under load. Now, usually it's the exhaust pipe hitting the frame side member, or any other part of the frame, as engine torque moves the engine on its flexible mountings. A bright spot on the exhaust pipe where it makes contact is the clue. If you find the spot, use a torch to heat the exhaust pipe and then bend the pipe to get increased clearance. Uh, don't bend it too much or you'll kink the pipe. Uh, above all, don't bend the pipe cold or you'll break the exhaust manifold flange. Good advice, Tech. Now, sometimes there's a snapping, popping sound when an engine cools. It's caused by relative movement of the manifolds at the intake to exhaust manifold gasket when the exhaust manifold contracts. It might even cause the gasket to creep. A thin coat of Mopar lead plate on each side of the gasket will prevent the noise. Besides that, a new intake to exhaust manifold gasket is available. It has three anchoring tabs. Use it as a replacement whenever necessary to prevent gasket creep and apply lead plate to prevent noise. Okay, Mac. What else is special on engines? About the biggest news is the new 225 cubic inch aluminum block engine, which is now in limited production for United States cars. Since the aluminum engine might come in for service, we'll have to be ready. Among the new features are cast iron cylinder liners and cast iron upper main bearing caps as well as lower bearing caps. In general, service is the same. The only torque that's different is on the main bearing caps and it's important to tighten them to 50 foot-pounds and no tighter. But remember, Kurt, all tightening on an aluminum block must be done at room temperature, never when hot. You'll find other tips like that along with special bolt dimensions in this reference book. Swell, Tech. I'll give that book a close inspection. That's the spirit. And practice the tips we talked about today. Our owners expect top engine work from us. And besides, it's the key to repeat service sales.